So good afternoon all and uh, welcome to uh, the latest in our webinar series. Uh, my name is Ian Mannion. I am co-chair of the National Infant, Child and Youth Mental Health Consortium. Uh, I believe that on the phone today we probably have some representatives from the consortium. My guess would be though we have many people that this is uh, their first experience with uh, one of the consortium's the knowledge exchange activities. Uh, the consortium is, is a uh, very much a collection of uh, dedicated uh, professionals, individuals, parents and young people uh, that are all have a shared vision for trying to do better by child needs mental health across the country. We do this through knowledge exchange uh, and the webinar is one example of our knowledge exchange activities. Uh, but we also have focused activities in terms of uh, specific topics that we're trying to uh, move the yardsticks on in child and youth mental health. And one of the current activities that we're engaged in is looking at access and wait times in child and youth mental health across the country. Today, uh, we are uh, very pleased uh, to have uh, two uh, very uh, well-known champions for child and youth mental health uh, joining us for the webinar titled, Why Can't I Get Any Information About My Child's Mental Health Problem? Uh, we have Don Buchanan with us today. Don is the Knowledge and Mobilization Officer with the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. Uh, Don is a, an incredibly knowledgeable individual when it comes to child and youth mental health. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Don and continue to work with Don on a number of initiatives, uh, provincial, national, and international. He happens to be the person, I think, who knows more details about more topics than anybody else in the world that I've ever met. So it's a pleasure for us to have Don join us today. Also, uh, we have uh, Michael Chang. Michael is a child and youth psychiatrist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. Uh, Michael is uh, very much an innovator in child and youth mental health. You'll be hearing about some of his ideas. Uh, not only is he a, a tireless champion for trying to find innovative ways to bring information to families and service providers, but he's also a dedicated clinician. And I've heard from many families that have had the opportunity to benefit from his expertise, um, just how much they, they appreciate the fact that he's come at the right time to help them get on a course uh, to facilitate their child or young person's wellness. Uh, I'm going to just introduce Lisa Stromquist, who is the national coordinator for the consortium, who's going to give us some background and housekeeping items in terms of how the webinar will actually work today. Lisa. Good afternoon. Um, Everybody, uh, everybody's lines are muted as they come on to the webinar today. That's because we have such a large audience. We have over 100 people uh, registered. So uh, we're going to keep all the lines muted. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can either type it into your control panel. There's a, um, a question panel there. And uh, you can either chat or ask a question. And if you would like to participate in uh, a live chat or a uh, um, ask your question live, you would uh, need to have a working microphone and uh, speakers on your computer if you're signed in through VoIP, or if you want to dial in, uh, you can use the telephone in the audio section. You can uh, choose to um, dial in through the telephone. It will give you the dial-in, uh, the toll-free number, an access code, and an audio pin, which would allow you to uh, be unmuted and to ask your question live. So those are the options you have. Um, we'll take a few questions uh, during the um, presentations as they come up. We'll try to uh, keep things moving though in respect of everybody's time and, and because the information is all going to be so exciting. So without further ado, yeah, we will be doing a, a couple of polls as well during the, uh, during the presentations. Um, so you will be asked to participate. Uh, the questions will come up on your screen, and you'll be able to select uh, from a multiple choice uh, uh, question. So uh, without any uh, further ado, I will hand it back to, are we going to hand it over to Don? I hand it over to Don. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, my pleasure to um, get us started on this uh, chat for today. Um, I, I want to first start off with um, a little bit of explanation of what the Child and Youth Mental Health Information Network is. You'll see the little logo down in the corner. And 
Um, it, this is a very loosely organized, I say that because I'm one of the organizers of it, so it's very loosely organized, um, a coalition um, consortium of people who are interested in the province of Ontario about providing good quality mental health information to parents, to teachers, to folks um, who need that kind of information. Um, members include um, the Provincial Center of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health, sorry, the Ontario Center of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health, um, the Alfred Center for Child Studies, um, the Community Resources Group at the Hospital for Sick Children, Children's Mental Health Ontario, um, the eBest team here at um, the, the uh, Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. Um, Mike was a was a member as as part of the e mental health program be, before it became part of the child and youth um, mental health information. Uh, sorry, part of the uh, Ontario Center of Excellence. And um, Hinks Delcrest um, is also a member of of our group. So we um, meet and talk about um, what we're doing in helping our patients and our families to understand more about child and youth mental health problems and how we can better provide information to them. So that's enough plug for, for the, um, the, the group that we're working with. Lisa, do you want to launch the first poll, please? So what I'm going to ask you is, is uh, often clinicians will say, well, parents don't really want information about their children's mental health problems. They, they never ask me for, for information, so I don't, I don't really think there's a need for that. So I'm going to ask you right now, what percentage of parents of children with mental health problems um, would like to receive information about those problems? Is that, do you think it's less than 10%? Do you think it's about a third of parents? Do you think it's about two-thirds? Or do you think it's more than 90%? Um, we're going to give you a couple of minutes to, um, actually a couple of seconds here, to choose your answer. Just click on the um, little white uh, circle in front of there. It's a radio button. Choose one of those answers and submit your answer, and Lisa will let us know when we've got about 80% of the answers in. And can you, I can't quite read those results, Lisa. Can you read them for me, please? 63% said more than 90% of uh, parents would like to receive information. 31% um, said about two-thirds, 5% said about one-third, and 2% said less than 10%. And 87% of our audience has voted. That's great. Okay. So let me share some, some uh, research data about this. And I'm going to try and, um, in, in the way we structured our talk, is I'm going to try and briefly present some of the most relevant research, I think, about some of these questions um, in perhaps the first 20 minutes or so. Um, then we're going to launch into some more real-life examples of uh, some of the things that we've done, certain the projects that, that Michael's been working on. This is um, results from the Brief Child and Family Phone Interview, um, which is a uh, telephone triage screening tool that's used um, in a number of provinces across Canada right now. Um, and it as simply asks parents, and these again are parents of children who've been referred to a children's mental health center, um, whether you, they would value information or training. You'll see from this that in fact the, the, there's a huge support for further readings, about 94% of parents say yes, I'd like more, the 3% of them maybe. Videos um, come in second with about 88%, 83% um, uh, would be interested in parent training, and only 72% would actually be interested in, um, in a, a parent support group um, with, with uh, increasing, uh, you know, none of those except the parent support group drops below 90% um, uh, yes or maybe answers in, in that. Um, so let me, let me talk about some of, the, some of the research that we did in um, uh, this. We, this is part of a uh, CIHR uh, grant that um, Dr. Chuck Cunningham and Dr. Pat McGraw, Chuck is at uh, McMaster here, uh, Pat's at uh, Dell out in Halifax, so a, a broad national emerging uh, team, uh, did some work in, in looking at how do we get better information and how do we know how to get information to parents. So we started off with some focus groups. We did um, six focus groups with three fathers and three mothers, a total of 43 parents. We did the all the um, sort of procedures for a high-quality um, uh, focus group. We videotaped and we did verbatim transcripts. Um, we used a, a qualitative research program called N6 um, 
to uh, analyze the focus groups and, and talk about exactly um, the, the themes that came out of that. From that um, theme, from the themes that we found in the um, uh, groups, one of them was, was the willingness, what do parents say about looking for information? What's their experience in, in um, trying to find good information? And these are all direct quotes taken out of the transcripts. Um, one parent said, we're the enemy because they have to check you out as a family. So we weren't getting information at a critical period of time. So we had to go and get it ourselves um, so that we could support her in some way. Uh, teachers and doctors early on, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, and doctors, they all put everything back on the parent. And if a parent doesn't go out and find their own resources, then they don't, then they don't get them. Uh, physicians. Uh, when I first went to the doctor, I was shoved off because I was young. I was a single mom. You just don't know how to be a parent, um, was, the, was the perception that this parent talked about. I find a lot of, is, of this is that the doctors don't listen to what you're trying to tell them. I can only speak English so slow until it sinks in. Do you know what I mean? Um, now, if you're in the mental health field, you might say, well, what's, what's the, the relevance of physicians and their responses to this? We know from the Ontario Child Health Study a good 20 years ago is this is the place where parents most often turn first to get help when their child is having a mental health problem. So they're turning their family doctors and, and physicians and asking them for information. We know from a number of other studies that often physicians feel ill-equipped to answer those questions and don't always know what the current um, sources of, of high quality information are. Uh, role of schools, and, and, and this is interesting, I actually have to say that I um, this predates my working for school board by a number of years. Um, so the, the somewhat positive results, um, actually the school I found was very cooperative. They're very positive in showing us how to pursue this and what routes to take. A lot of teachers might not have a good knowledge on ADHD. They might be just new teachers just learning. And the parents have high expectations on a school board for them to know all of the disabilities. And they get very frustrated with that. I mean, that's certainly an experience that, that uh, a lot of schools and a lot of educators report is, how do I keep up on all of this information? How do I know what, um, what's high quality information? Overall, some of the themes that we pulled out of this is that parents identified a number of concerns about the quality of information they encountered. Those included their inability to access relevant information. You, know, you, the, the, you type in a search term that you use in common language, and you discover that it spares nothing um, in resemblance. You type in um, out of control behavior and, and you may not find anything about some of the child diagnoses that are, that are um, associated with that. The second was the, the concerns about the credibility of the information. Um, many of the websites may be sponsored by organizations or commercial concerns that in fact have a pretty vested interest in convincing parents that their approach is the, the only one that's going to be effective. Encountering too much information, 10,000 websites on ADHD, it's probably more like 10 million websites now on ADHD. How do you filter through those? How do you know which are the high quality um, sites? And, and again, parents, um, those of you who, who work with uh, students, uh, whether that's, that's at the elementary or secondary or even university level, understand how the difficulty that some of our well-educated students have in sorting through what are good websites and what's reliable information and parents as a whole may have received no training in that. There's often contradictory information from different sources. Um, the, the, the complex content of the information and a concern from many websites that they have no idea whether or not the information is out of date. However, there were also a number of very specific benefits that parents could identify um, when they had found information that was useful to them. They told us it was particularly beneficial when it validated their concerns. When it said, yes, this is, you've got some reasons to be concerned about this. This is a, a, a serious problem. It would often reduce their sense of guilt that, that um, this wasn't something uh, that, that a lot of parents talk about the sort of blaming, the parent blaming for children's mental health problems. And the, uh, the ability to access information that said, no, this, many of these problems are not a result of parenting practices. Um, they're, they're a result of some more complex biological, social, and emotional factors. It offered them some reassurance that there were treatments um, that were effective for the problems. It consoled them that they were not alone. It gave them hope. And, and 
what I think is probably, in, in fact, the most important um, aspect and, and most important outcome that you can talk about in, in simply providing information is it could help them to perceive their child differently, that they understood that, that their, their daughter, adolescent daughter who was withdrawn and cranky and not very communicative, that there might be something other than she was being a brat. That there could, in fact, be some underlying problems there that were driving that kind of behavior. Mothers and fathers told they sometimes encountered information that made a significant difference in their lives and in the lives of their children. Uh, we asked what the value or benefit uh, was provided. Good information in, enabled parents to counter their own internal dialogue and fears to perceive their child better and to respond to their child differently. So what outcomes can we expect to be uh, affected by information? Well, parental knowledge and understanding is certainly the first one that you want to think about. What we call parental attribution. In other words, that what I was talking about earlier is the parent is attributing that behavior not to their child, not to it being part of normal adolescence, or not to a that their child hates them but in fact their child might be experiencing some emotional difficulties that are causing them to be sullen, that are causing them to be withdrawn, that are causing them to be tearful um, and, and crying all the time. Um, it also improves as, as some clear evidence, not just from mental health, but right across the healthcare field, that more information improves adherence to treatment and also um, improves the, or helps prevent relapses. Uh, when people start to understand that this isn't a, a, a this is a disorder that's going to magically disappear, but there is a possibility for a relapse that we need to be aware of those things and, and uh, think about how we prevent relapse. Following this, we, we, we took the, the, the themes from the focus groups and developed what's called a choice-based conjoint questionnaire. Um, this is a, a fairly innovative and, and um, interesting way of of gathering more information. Um, it's used often in the marketing field and it's really presenting parents with a number of different scenarios and asking them to pick which scenario they would prefer. Um, it's, uh, I always like to liken it to the um, uh, decision you make around buying a car. You know, what is the right car to buy? Well, if you're uh, early in, in your family life and you've got kids and soccer practices, that minivan may be the right van right vehicle for you to have. If you're a single person just starting out, then the economy car that gets great gas mileage um, may be the car that, you, that is best for you. Um, if you're, you know, someone my age, you're sort of getting on the, the, I like to refer to my latest car as my midlife Chrysler, you know, the sporty uh, uh, car that, that uh, perhaps provides something that isn't hauling and, and economy. So, so each one of us has some preferences around what car we might buy. And, and that doesn't mean that any one of those is the right or wrong car. But we need to understand those preferences if we're going to start to actually target individuals and, and their preferences for um, things. And what we looked at was, was what are the sort of segments of parents? How do they organize themselves? How, how do they prefer to receive information? And we really found there were three major um, groups that we could um, take a look at. Um, the, the largest group was the action-oriented um, parents. These are, these are uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about. The second largest was information-oriented, and then our third group um, was uh, what we would call overwhelmed parents. Uh, this is from a study you'll see of uh, slightly over 11,000, nearly 12,000, sorry, 1,200 parents. Um, all of whom were seeking services at a variety of children's mental health centers across um, Ontario. Um, there's, a, there's a knowledge translation piece about this particular study that's, a, that's um, attached to our presentation later on. We'll give you the, the in-depth details. I'm just trying to give you some uh, real highlights on it. Um, so action-oriented parents, they preferred information that would help them solve step-by-step -step their, their child's emotional problems. They preferred information that made them feel um, more informed and made them feel more confident or hopeful. The action-oriented parents also preferred information that included review questions to help with understanding and some practice exercises to improve skills. 
So very much skill based. I, I want to. I want something that I can start on right now that I can think about um, working on um, immediately. The second um, largest group were the information oriented folks. As with action oriented parents, they preferred information to receive information there on their own rather than in a group. Their strongest preference was that information was available in a book or a pamphlet, and that the information made them feel more informed. Now, when we talk about information oriented, one of the things to, to draw from that is these may be folks who aren't ready to act um, immediately. They they want to they want some more information about what the problem is, um, as you would with any other kind of health problem you you run into. You might want to find out what the possible treatments are, what's the cost of those treatments going to be, not, not necessarily in dollars, but in terms of my time and my energy, um, how, what, making off that, that sort of balance between how much time do I have to invest to solve this problem versus how serious a problem, how much is this affecting me at this time. So these are folks who may not be ready to act on information you give them. And I think this, this was actually one of the more interesting insights that I got out of this study. As a, as a clinician for um, quite a few years in a children's mental health clinic, I think I had always presumed that all of the parents and all of the families and all the young people coming to my office were ready for action. They were ready to change things. I mean, they jumped through enough hoops to get there. Um, our whole intake process was focused on trying to identify people that had serious enough problems and, and, and needed some help to change those things. But when I look at this, it, it, uh, what I was missing is that a lot of people were not coming for change, but were in fact coming for information. They wanted to learn more about the problem and, and then make a decision. Um, just like you might spend a couple of weeks going around the car lots, kicking some tires, understanding the features and the costs of different cars before you chose a particular car. The last um, group, uh, which is the smallest group, it, it, this is kind of interesting because whenever I present this, most clinicians say, oh, that's not the smallest group. That's 100% of my caseload. That's everyone I work with. Um, these may be the folks that we remember the most. These are the overwhelmed parents. These are parents that felt that information made them feel more stressed and made them feel guilty. Um, in contrast to the two other groups, this group of parents preferred that information was left up to them to find or only given to them if they asked for it. They're, I, I go so far as to say they're information averse. They're, they're not really, um, information probably isn't going to be that helpful to them um, at, at this point in, in this, their struggles. Demographics is one of the first things people ask. The three groups did not differ on their education level, on their immigrant status, or language background. This was consistent of uh, uh, none of the what we might think are the traditional demographic indicators um, were true. Um, the only one where we found a difference, a gender difference, is that there were more mothers in the action-oriented group than fathers, um, which is kind of interesting. The, the moms were ready for some action. The dads tended to be, OK, let me give you a book about that. Let me read about it and think about it some. Um, single parents and parents with lower incomes were more likely to be in the overwhelmed group. Parents in the overwhelmed group were also more likely to report that they themselves were depressed. So again, they are feeling quite burdened and overwhelmed by um, the problems that, that their children are having. All of this uh, information is from the Brief Child and Family Phone Interview, which asks these questions pretty routinely. The Children of overwhelmed parents also showed some differences, as seen by the BCFPI. Parents in the overwhelmed group reported their children had more externalizing problems and oppositional behavior than the two other groups, and they also reported greater problems in family functioning. So you can see this is, this is in fact, a, a slice of the overall um, referral population that has some some greater problems that then information alone is certainly going to help them with. So once we finished that up, one of the things we started to talk about and think about was the, was the other end is, is how do clinicians prefer to give information? Whoops, I'm going to back that up for a second. Lisa, do you want to stick in the second poll now, please? If you were really fast, you've already seen the answers to this. So what percentage of mental health professionals feel that information about children's mental health problems 
should be automatically provided to parents. Sorry, we cut that off. It's, it's to parents. Less than 10%, about a third, about two-thirds, or more than 90%. So what percentage of mental health professionals feel that information about children's mental health problems should be automatically provided to parents? So 30% uh, of folks said more than 90% of uh, mental health professionals uh, feel that children's, uh, feel that information about children's mental health problems should be automatically provided. And 42% uh, about two-thirds, 27% about a third, and 1% uh, said less than 10%. Okay. Well, let's flash back to the screen and, and I'll, I'll share the news with you. In fact, about a third of clinicians felt there should be open access to this information, that it should automatically be provided as, as, as part of the, uh, the, the intake process. Um, the next largest, well, the largest group was, was about 46% of clinicians who were very sensitive to the processes around how that information was provided. And then we had a, a smaller group, about 22%, who were uh, talked about controlled access. Process sensitive folks preferred to get information through active learning materials, through parenting groups, and through therapist coaching calls. So to them it was about building a relationship, about, about an interactive um, way in which to deliver that information. They also showed a stronger preference for regularly scheduled workshops that introduced professionals to children's mental health information resources. So they felt they needed to improve their skills and learn more about um, so, some of the resources that were out there. And the mental health professionals who identified themselves as therapists were more likely to be members of this segment, as opposed to intake workers or administrators or all the other kinds of varied rules. If you identify yourself as a therapist, you're more likely to be part of the process sensitive group. You see this as, as part of that interactional um, work that you do with your clients. The open access folks, on the other hand, which were the second largest group, um, preferred that workers automatically provide all parents visiting their agency with information about children's mental health problems even before a formal assessment was completed. They preferred information that was prepared by professional organizations and easily accessible at community locations such as public schools and online. So uh, you can guess Michael and I are both members of, of this segment here, um, the kind of open access folks who think it's important to share this uh, information. I, 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 we could have a whole discussion about the um, power balance and, and some of those kinds of issues that go along with that, but I think we'll just focus on uh, our topic for today. And then the, um, the last group, the third and smallest group, about 22%, was controlled access and their preferences for providing information. They provided, preferred information that was prepared by an experienced clinician, approved and recommended by a child's therapist, and located at hospitals and children's mental health clinics. So not out in the public domain, not on websites, um, a, a, a quite a controlled process where you only get information once you've been seen by a clinician, that clinician has approved the information that you're going to see, um, and, and, uh, and, and that's the kind of process that's um, behind that. Any questions about, about that, either one of those studies at this point? No, um, there's no uh, there's no questions about this yet. Uh, there, somebody was asking though if it's possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint, and we will be posting uh, the entire presentation on the Casting Knowledge Exchange Network, and we'll show you that link uh, after the presentations are done. Yeah, and, and as I say, there's um, this is a very very quick overview. I've got a more in depth um, view of both of these studies. And both have been published um, in, you know, highly respected peer-reviewed journals. The um, citation for the article is uh, in each of those. So you can you can go back to the original literature if you if you'd like to look at. There's a wealth of information. I could spend four hours talking about any either one of those studies. Um, some more um, of the characteristics around those therapist groups. The three groups of therapists, or uh, sorry, of mental health professionals. 
did not differ in their ratings of the benefits of children's mental health information. They all agreed that children's mental health information helped parents make better treatment decisions and feel more confident, that it reduced parental stress, and it improved the outcome of other treatments. So they're all agreeing that it's, it's not a disagreement about the value of this information. Um, fewer felt that information helped parents reduce their children's behavioral or emotional problems. So they didn't see that, that this information could, in fact, be treatment unto itself. So again, what are the barriers to finding information? Um, the, the clinicians were concerned about exactly the same things that the parents were. Uh, is the information up to date? Has it been filtered? Is it accurate? And then, and then there was this other interesting thing that we, that we talked about and, and uh, came out in some of our discussions is, is this issue of, of um, localization. So what information is the same for all communities and what information is community specific? And much of the work that, that I've done in, in developing um, information products has been um, at the generic end, the, the information that's the same for all communities. High quality information about attentional problems in kids or, or um, mood problems in, in kids is going to be pretty much the same from one end of the country to the other. There may be some differences. We're actually um, uh, have done a lot of work in translating these into um, additional languages, the, the major immigrant um, languages um, to date, to make them more broadly available and accessible. And then there's other information that all of us as, as uh, mental health professionals know is really quite unique to our community. How do I get help? What are the resources? What are the programs that are available? And that's really what Mike's going to talk a, a lot about, one of, one of the brilliant ideas he's come up with um, for, for providing a lot of that localized information, that community-specific information. Uh, and with that um, cue, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Michael to um, talk about uh, e-mental health. Okay. I assume that uh, Don and uh, Lisa and Ian, you can hear me? Absolutely, and everyone okay. else too. That's great. It, it's a bit bizarre being speaking but not being able to interact with the audience as, as easily in the face-to-face. -face. Anyways, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Mike Chang. I'm a child psychiatrist at the Children's Hospital. And I'd like to tell you about an initiative with the Center of Excellence known as eMental Health. Mental health information just to click away. So we'll start off with the poll question. Have you ever used the internet to look for mental health services in your area? Have you ever used the internet to look for mental health information, such as information about conditions? Uh, or what's the number one website that you've used? So I'll let uh, Lisa show those questions. So uh, Michael, 82% um, of people said yes, they have used the internet to look for mental health services in their area. Oh, excellent. And let's do the next question. Have you ever used the internet to look for mental health information? So rather than services, such as where to get help, uh, information would be have you ever used the net to find information about uh, depression or anxiety or other conditions? So a whopping 97% said uh, yes, they've used the internet to look for mental health information. Very interesting, very interesting. And let's do the last question. What's the number one website that you've used? Okay, uh, I'll be, I put the wrong question in, I think. So. Oh, what? okay. Uh, well, if we can't do that one, can no, do. no worries. No. Nope. Uh, we can ask people, Mike. We can ask people to um, to just write in an answer in their chat box. They okay, can write sure. In what is the number one uh, website that uh, they've used? So Great. Just you can just all put it in your chat or in your question. Naturally, we're looking for eMentalHealth.ca, but don't worry, you don't have to answer that because it's still helpful for us to know about what other awesome websites are out there. And Lisa, can I ask you to do one more question on the fly? Sure. Just, the yeah, question would be, the question would be, have you ever been outside of work in a, in a social setting and someone has asked you for where to go for mental health help? Okay, so let's um, get these first answers. Um, so some of the... Um, Answers that we've had to your first question was uh, teenmentalhealth.org. Center for Addictions and Mental Health. Uh, the University Library. Google Anxiety BC. Community Mental Health Association. 
the QLT mental health. That's really awesome. I'm actually very happy to say that most of those organizations we actually have listed as organizations in our database. And if and uh, even in addition, in addition to that, most of those we have as links on our website as resources. So that's great. And we'll definitely go over this list. And uh, any ones that aren't in, we'll uh, take a look at seriously including them in our in our website. Okay. So last question: Have any of you? been at a party or at your kid's soccer game or at the mall and then someone comes up to you and they say, hey, I hear you're a clinician. Where can I go for mental health help? Uh, so I guess, again, people can just write it in because I don't have the, the poll already created. Oh, okay. No worries. No worries. So there seems to be a lot of yeses. A lot of yes, 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 yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you. It's your answer to that last question, which is the real reason that we created eMental Health. <clears throat> it's nice to have information for patients and families, but the real reason is <clears throat> I was sick and tired of going out to parties or the mall or <sighs> and always getting stopped by people <laughs> who then say, hey, I hear you're a psychiatrist. Can you tell me, you know, my neighbor has this issue. Where can I get help? <clears throat> okay. So getting back to seriousness, uh, we are very fortunate to live in Canada. Canada is an awesome country, but we do face challenges. Not only do we have horrible weather, congestion, but one in five has a mental health condition. And the problem is, is that even when you go to see a professional to find out where to get help, oftentimes even those professionals don't know where to get help. Looking for help and information can be very frustrating. Many of us are in the field, and even even for us, it's hard to know where to get help. Uh, and then I remember in the old days, <clears throat> there was always one person who had, you know, the list of resources. And if you were lucky enough to get that list, then it was great. But oftentimes, if uh, someone was, you know, borrowing that list or photocopying it, then it was really hard to find out where to get help. So that's why we created eMental Health whether you're a professional, a parent, or individual, it should be easy to find out where to get information online in this day and age. E-Mental Health is an initiative of the Ontario Center of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health. And I'd like to also acknowledge any people from the Ministry of Children and Youth in Ontario. Thank you for your funding. And now, let's just quickly dive into a tour of the eMental Health website. So we'll start our tour in Ottawa. The project piloted first in Ottawa in, 19, in uh, 2005. And as you can see, when you get to eMental Health, what you see is a directory of services uh, organized by different categories. And in addition to that, you'll see links where you can access other types of information, like mental health events, mental health news, uh, mental health library where we have patient handouts, uh, mental health checkups where you can access screening tools, and a research directory where local investigators can put information about studies that are happening. We, are, we have had interest from partners in other communities, which is why uh, our site is available in some other communities. Uh, we're mainly located in Ontario as an initiative, but there's a growing number of communities outside of Ontario. On eMental Health, you can browse for different types of mental health services and resources by categories, such as uh, mental health topics, uh, counseling and therapy, mental health professionals. And you can also browse for information and referral services. These are services like 211. Uh, E-Mental Health does not have all services for every possible uh, issue or social service, and that's why we have listings of other information and referral services. How do you search for information on E-Mental Health? Well, thanks to the wonderful people at Google, we have a Google-style search box. So if you know what you're looking for, so if you know you're looking for anger or addictions, then you can just click on those topics. But if you just want to search by typing in a keyword, you can do that too. 
after you type in your keyword, you'll get all sorts of information uh, in different ways. So one of the types of information we have is we have listings of local mental health services, as you can see here. On the left side, you see a little concise list of some of the main mental health services in Ottawa, uh, along with uh, contact information and links. And in many communities, we find there's a lot of other organizations which have prepared their own resource lists. Uh, oftentimes, the people in the autism community have their own specialized list of resources. So we don't like to reinvent the wheel. So in those cases, we often simply post or link to those uh, mental health services as well. Uh, for those of you who mentioned CAMH earlier as a, an excellent website, uh, as you can see on the right side, we actually link to their challenges and choices document on how to find mental health services in Ontario. Now, after you've seen some of the services that pop up if you do a search, such as if you search for depression, we also list local agencies uh, in our database, like let's say in Ottawa, it would be Youth Services Bureau. So uh, a listing for that agency has more information. Uh, in some cases, we have more detailed information about their programs. And uh, later on, when we do the live demo, you'll see the, the nice map to the agency. eMental Health has an events calendar. So I'm sure we've all gotten those emails about this uh, conference happening and this seminar happening and this workshop happening and you know most of the time I just delete them but uh, every once in a while you you realize hey you know I deleted that email but I really do want to go to that workshop after all uh, so eMental Health has a community events calendar where local organizations can post information about their events and it also makes it easy for people in that community to find out what mental health events are happening As a clinician, oftentimes I have patients come to me and they say, you know, Dr. Chang, we just read this article and it says that primal scream therapy is the therapy for autism. Uh, can you tell us more about that? And so it's hard being a clinician in mental health because there's so much happening out there and it's hard to keep an eye on everything that's happening in the media and all our journals. So what we have in eMental Health is we have a news feed feature where eMental Health collab, uh, collects some of the main mental health uh, related news from some of the major media and that makes it easy for any clinician to keep up to date on what's happening in mental health. As you can see some of the news feeds we have are the Mental Health Commission of Canada news feed, uh, other um, journals and, and other news sources. We have a mental health library. So let's say you are a parent and you're looking for information about uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or you're looking for information about alcohol. Many families come to me and they tell me, yeah, we saw the family doc and they're at the walk-in clinic and they only had 10 minutes. And so they gave us all these websites. But, you know, can you just give us something simple to read that we can trust? And so that's where the e-mental health library comes in. We work with content partners, uh, and we're in networks such as the Child and Youth Mental Health Information Network with excellent colleagues such as Don Buchanan at the Knowledge Center. And we either create information or we link to credible information that our partners have produced. And so let's say you see a family and there's issues with social anxiety. So the eMental Health Library makes it easy to access that information. You can print it out for the family uh, and you can email them the link. Uh, if you're like my hospital, we're, we're always in a deficit these days it seems and so uh, we're really discouraged from printing out things. So you can email pages to families. Now another issue that I often encounter in my practice is I'll speak to family docs or social workers, and they'll often say, you know, I suspect this student has troubles with depression, but I'm not really sure. Uh, you know, they seem depressed, but I'm not really sure. Uh, you know, and, 
and the challenge is, is that they can refer to specialized mental health services, but oftentimes that takes weeks, months, or even more. Wouldn't it be nice if a family or a social worker or a teacher could get some early idea if there might be some you know, risk of a mental health issue? So that's why we have mental health screening tools, which are collections of validated screening tools on e-mental health. So for example, here you're looking at the Kutcher Adolescent Depression Scale, which is a validated screening tool for depression in adolescents. And actually, I think for this part, it might be better if I just go online. So I'm just going to go online to show that. So I was saying this is the dilemma that we often have, where we might be working with a family or a youth, and we wonder if this youth might have a, a mental health issue. So if you're a family doc, you might be challenged because you only have five minutes to see the patient. Or if you're a family uh, or a school social worker, you might want to refer to a family doc, but the family might not even have anyone. So wouldn't it be nice if there was an easy way to see ahead of time what issues your child or youth might have? So this is where screening tools are helpful. So as you see, I've just filled out the Quit Your Adolescent Depression Scale here. I'm going to click on View Your Results. And what eMental Health does is it scores the validated screening tool. And then based on the scores, then it either recommends resources, services, or other information. So based on this score for this hypothetical patient, it looks like this uh, youth is at risk of having depression. So then it says you might be interested in the following resources. And let's click on counseling and therapy. And then we, we get a list of uh, different types of counseling and therapy resources. And it's organized by headings uh, in, in this case. So if we're looking, let's say we're looking for CPT, it makes it really easy to see a resource. Uh, so in this case, uh, let's say I decide to go with uh, Catholic Family Services. I'll click on that. Then you get a detailed page which has more information about that service. And then let's say I want to recommend this to the family. I can do a few things. I can either print it out and hand it to them, but I don't want my manager to see me that I'm see that I'm printing out things. So in this case, I'll just you can just click share, and then you can email it uh, to that family. Most families have emails these days. Now, let's say I'm actually from Catholic Family Service Ottawa, and I'm looking at my my listing, and I see that it's out of date. Not a problem. E-mental health relies on distributed content management, so we make it easy for an agency to update their information and let us know if something's wrong, uh, and naturally all of the information that anyone submits is screened by our administrators or our local partners in whichever community we're working in. Okay, so we've just looked at uh, some of our screening tools and we've looked at how easy it is to screen someone. And not only that, uh, in addition to being able to screen someone, our site makes it easy to connect to local health, uh, local information and help. Uh, let's just do another one. Uh, we'll do depression in adults, and uh, as you can see, it's a very brief screening tool. Interestingly enough, uh, screening for depression in adults uh, using this tool is apparently over 85% sensitive for depression. Uh, in this case, uh, this person is at high risk, and I'm going to point out here that in addition to, to um, links to services, uh, there's also links to mental health information. and so. Let's say you're seeing that family, you've scored the screening tool, you want to give them some information because as Don says, many families want information. All you do is you click on the handout and then you get to our handouts on mental health, which are created through either uh, our own uh, content teams or our partners. Uh, interestingly enough, let's say that you are printing this out for a family. Uh, you can actually add your own contact information, so you can add the, your name and the organization you're at, and then that actually uh, goes on to the uh, printout, so it makes it look a bit more professional. Now let's say, in addition to the uh, handout, you, you, want, um, you want to see what links might have more information. You want to find out other websites that might have information about depression, you just click on links here, and then we 
link to other uh, websites that have information. So in this case, uh, it looks like we linked to our uh, our friends who have done some good work in BC. Uh, looks like we have some stuff on teen mental health, uh, etc. Uh, just so you know, our system is not yet perfect. Um, and I just noticed here that we have teen stuff when probably we should have more adult stuff. But that is something we have to work out. OK, so we've looked at uh, the fact that using eMental Health, it's easy to find information about different conditions. Uh, I don't know if anyone here is from the is is with uh, Veterans Affairs or if anyone here is from the Department of National Defense, but we we also make it easy for our colleagues uh, in National Defense and family members of military members. We make it easy for them to find out information as well. So uh, something I want to show you here is um, in addition to being able to search for information by location and province, you can also actually enter in which uh, Canadian Forces base is nearest you, and you can find information that way too. Uh, but I digress. Let's go back to the main page. Uh, we've talked Michael? about... Uh, yes? I actually do have a question for you about uh, the screening tool. Yes. So uh, the question is from Daniel Demers, and it is, could screening by non-qualified professionals be dangerous and out of the scope of their responsibilities? We, we believe that giving information to people will help them learn more. And I can definitely appreciate that there are certain conditions that people might have that you want them to be diagnosed by uh, a professional. So if we're looking at a condition, let's, let's say, such as schizophrenia, uh, you don't want them to be treated for schizophrenia unless they've been properly diagnosed. Now, the wonderful thing about these screening tools that we have is they're actually screening tools, and they're not diagnostic tools. And so all of these have been tested uh, to be valid for screening. And it is our belief that, let's say you're talking about a condition like schizophrenia, and let's say it's a family member or a social worker screening. At worst, the person doesn't have schizophrenia, but then at least they'll get information about it. And then they can follow up with their family physician. Uh, so what we always emphasize here is that no matter what they score, if there are concerns, we say, see your doctor or health professional. Uh, and the, the disclaimer always is that uh, no matter what your concern is, you must, you know, you should seek help with a professional. So I don't know if that answers the question. I guess in summary, I'd say we believe that in most cases, if people believe they have a condition, they will go on their own to find out information about it anyways. And we believe that by using um, validated screening tools, at least if they're going to find out information, at least we can point them closer in the right direction. And then at the end of the day, if there is something that seems positive, then they should see a professional. So don't know if that answers uh, the question. Uh, if it doesn't, definitely, uh, Daniel, please let me know. And then at the end, uh, we'd be happy to, to further address that. And well, Daniel, I don't know if Ian Mannion, I don't know, Don or Ian, if you want to comment on this issue as well. I, I think you've touched on the nail on the head. These are screening tools. and. Uh, uh, very often they are the first step in someone identifying a potential problem for follow-up. And what these tools tend to be is quite sensitive. So I think it would be quite reassuring for someone to fill out a, a screening tool and realize that, that their problem is probably within more than normal range. And perhaps there no, are no other steps that are required. But clearly, as identified on, on e-mental health, when you hit a range that might be problematic, the suggestion is for more action, including accessing someone that might be able to make a diagnosis uh, beyond simply screen. Yeah. As a, as a child psychiatrist, I, I can definitely appreciate the concern about overdiagnosis. Uh, one of my personal uh, issues is when families come to me and they say, my kid has bipolar disorder and can you please start him on lithium? So definitely I get that concern. Uh, what I would say is that in general, though, families are actually – uh, in need of more information about mental health. Uh, so uh, in clinical practice, we haven't really seen that as an issue. Okay, so 
maybe so I'll go on. More yep, comments. a couple more comments, yes. The, uh, and then we'll get back to the presentation. So uh, Daniel says, thank you for your answers. And uh, I have a comment from uh, Julie Cole. From, uh, Julie Cole. No, sorry. Oh, Jennifer. Jennifer Hopkins says, as transparency is family-centered and very important for professionals to appreciate. And um, Julie Collette asks, uh, so you briefly showed Vancouver, BC information. Are these resources as extensive as the Ontario resources? No. eMental Health is a pilot project that started in Ottawa. So our best database is with Ottawa resources. But the interesting thing about databases is once you create a system that works for one city, it's not difficult at all to have the same system working for other communities. So we have the potential for eMental Health to have a complete database for any, any area or region in Canada. Uh, for British Columbia, we've had some uh, early partnerships with the Kelty Center, and we're, we're looking forward to continuing our work with the Kelty Center so we can expand our database for British Columbia. But um, at the moment, uh, I do regret that British Columbia is not as well populated as Ontario. Uh, but definitely check it out. Uh, I would say that even though we do not have partners in every community in Canada, we do we have done our best to try and enter in at least provincial level help and information for other provinces. So let's, uh, for, for fun, let's just go to, um, let's go to Newfoundland. So for Newfoundland, even though we don't have partners in all of these areas, uh, if you click on, let's say, let's say we're looking for a psychologist uh, in, in, uh, in this area, we, we still get to provincial level information, such as the Association of Psychology. So through this, any family member could then find more local information. Uh, uh, and even if we didn't have the provincial information about psychologists in that area, uh, we have national organizations like the Canadian Register of Psychologists. So you can still click on this and find out help in your local area. So I guess my answer to the question would be, we are hoping to expand to other areas in Canada if, uh, if there's interest from other local communities. And in the meanwhile, even for areas where we don't have uh, extensive resources like in Ottawa, we still have at least good provincial level and national level resources. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Mike? Any other questions before we continue? I just want to add something to that piece. Uh, wearing a different hat in the province of Ontario, uh, where we have the most uptake because of, of uh, this is being where it's, it's really initiated. If there's a community in Ontario that's interested in taking this on, the Ontario Center of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health actually has additional resources to assist the community in their initial uh, uploading of information into eMentalHealth.ca. So, uh, because we are an Ontario resource at the center, we want this. Uh, this particular tool, eMentalHealth.ca, to be available in every community in the province of Ontario. Thanks very much, Ian. Okay, so at this point, uh, maybe I'll just mention mention some of the uh, some administrative technical issues for those of you who are executive directors and might be interested in bringing eMentalHealth to your community. So I'll go back to my slideshow, and so. E-Mental Health is not software that anyone needs to download on your computer to manage a database. It's all done in the internet, so it makes it easy for any community to manage. As long as you have internet connection, uh, you can manage and set up your own E-Mental Health database. Uh, some communities might think, oh, it seems like a lot of work to set up a database, but actually it's not that much work. Uh, Many communities that we're partnered with tell us that before you mental health, they kept their local resources as a Word document, which is actually a lot more work to maintain. Uh, we help keep our database populated by uh, letting people just suggest their own resources and editors review and approve new submissions. Uh, we have a system of automated emails that can get sent out to organizations in our database asking those local listings to look at the resource and make sure it's up to date. 
And uh, as we were just saying, we are primarily an Ontario-based project, but if there are other communities that would like this, uh, we're happy to talk with you. And I should mention some of the other INR services out there. E-Mental Health started about five years ago, and at that point in, well, actually not five years ago, but in, in let's say around 2004 or so. And at that point in time, it was hard to find uh, mental health resources online. Uh, over the past few years, though, it's been very exciting because there are now more and more agencies uh, that are putting information online. Information uh, and referral agencies include our colleagues at 211 uh, in Ontario, our colleagues at Mental Health Helpline with Connex, uh, and there's other INR services such as Kids Help Phone. So eMental Health does not seek to duplicate or take away from what those services do. Every one of these services has a unique niche that they do better than anyone else. And so our goal is to find our niche and do a good job at it, uh, but we don't pretend to do everything. For example, we are not a telephone service. And so that's why uh, on eMental Health, we have a link that says INR Services. And you can easily find out about the local 211 or other um, Connex or other services that are in your area. In the long run, we actually hope to collaborate uh, with those other INR services. I think it will be really exciting in the future if we can all share databases and collaborate together. Uh, then it's less work. Uh, and that's something that we look forward to. Uh, I know for many of you, this might be the first time you're hearing about eMental Health, but uh, we've actually been in, in the news and in some major reports for a while. eMental Health was actually recommended for national expansion in the reaching for the top report. Uh, unfortunately, there was a, an election called a few months after this came out, so uh, nothing's really changed since then, but we're still hoping. Uh, other things that are happening with eMental Health is everything I've shown you today is going to change. Uh, so we are hoping to have a new website in a month or two. Uh, we're actually, sorry, it's probably more like a few months, but uh, that should be exciting to see. And for those of you who'd like more information, you can feel free to contact myself or our program coordinator, uh, and you can do that just by visiting us on the website. Let me just pull up the website here to contact us. All you have to do is click on the contact link, and uh, and we'll be happy to talk with you. Any other final questions? Then uh, I guess that that basically brings us to the close of my presentation about eMental Health. Feel free to check it out. Feel free to do your own searches, and feel free to give us your feedback. So thank you very much to both Don and, and Michael. I'm going to open it up to questions and just to remind people that uh, you can do that uh, by typing in your question that we will uh, read for you or you can uh, uh, just uh, speak through your phone and address the question to either Michael uh, or to Don. Actually Ian, I've got about three more slides or four more slides to go through quickly. I'm I'm conscious we do want to leave some uh, time for questions, so I'll try and move through these um, fairly quickly. I just wanted to talk. I'm, I'm kind of pre pre computer literacy from from Michael's, um, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some of my other projects that I've worked on um, that are more text based. Um, one of the things we've done is is uh, develop a community education flyer. Um, which is a single web-based system that collects information about parenting courses and things of that um, nature in different communities. You can distribute this in print and electronic formats. Um, again, as with the um, e-mental health, it's a distributed workload methodology, so all of the different agencies in the community can each enter their own information um, into a single database, which then produces the, uh, the, either the electronic or the printed resource. Um, it is currently being used in a number of communities in Ontario and British Columbia. Uh, here in Hamilton, we've, where we've been using it the longest, um, we've uh, printed about we we print about seventy thousand copies of this flyer each time it comes out, and then it's sent home through our schools to every parent um, who has a child in school. Um, so we get some very wide distribution that way. One of the other projects I've worked on. Um, 
or those the more traditional ones are our book lists. Um, this is one that uh, we use in our local community through McMaster Children's Hospital um, and the Offord Center for Child Studies. I've shared these with other organizations. There's no cost to um, to use the lists. Um, you'll see that they divide the information, the background information, and step-by-step -step guides to reflect that, that research that we have on parents' preferences. Um, there's the, they're also cross-referenced um, to our public library, so it'll, it'll show a little symbol if it's available in the public library. They um, include videos and, and DVDs, because we know that's also a media that parents would like to um, look at, and websites with high-quality information. These come in tear-off pads, um, half of an 8 and half by 11 sheet, and as I say, are available in lots of other communities. We actually took a, a variation of these and worked on um, a, a project with the uh, government of British Columbia who wanted to get some more of this information out across the province. So we um, picked the four lists on the most common mental health problems, um, anxiety, attention, behavior, and mood. All of the books, is about 45 books on those four lists together, were distributed to every single public, health, public library across the whole province. So they worked with the BC Public Library System as their distribution method. But then they sent out the, the information sheets to physicians and public health nurses and mental health centers, all of them saying these books are available in your public library. This is a place where you can turn for information. Um, so you get that nice kind of linkage between the, the health professionals recommending the materials and the public library system providing the access to the materials. And then the last one I just want to talk about uh, again is the series of information pamphlets that um, we've developed at the Offord Center through their Center of Knowledge on Healthy Child Development. Um, there's now eight different titles that are available um, in the series, the big four, the attention, anxiety, behavior and mood, as well as autism, Tourette syndrome, um, uh, eating problems, and drug and alcohol problems. Um, these are currently available in English, French, Punjabi, simplified Chinese, and traditional Chinese. So a total of 40 different um, uh, pamphlets there. You can, you can also um, get a CD that has all 40 of them available. You can print them off. They're, they're in a slightly different format than what you're seeing here. They're done for this part of the project as, as a black and white um, two-page. You can do black and white front and back, a single sheet handout to reduce your, your printing costs. But you can actually install this on your agency-wide server if you're that um, sophisticated and give everyone access to it. Or a clinician can simply put it on their, on their desktop and just print off one copy at a time as they need it. So those are some other um, possibilities there. Um, time for questions. I've put my contact information up there because I'm willing to, to field questions about um, any of those projects that I've been involved with as well too. And, and now we can open it up for questions. Uh, John, I have uh, some, uh, Diane is wondering how she can get access to those resources you just highlighted. They're actually all already been deposited on the Knowledge Exchange Network at CAFC. Um, which is the link that you'll be um, uh, going to. All of the book lists are there, all of the pamphlets are there in all of those languages. They're also available through the Knowledge Center on Healthy Child Development, which is part of the Offered Center for Child, uh, child Studies um, website. Um, so either one of those, they're available for free download. So, so Don and Michael, uh, you know, you can't necessarily hear the audience but uh, through the, the wonders of technology, we have Daniel that have sent you multiple applauses, and Jay who thanks you uh, in bold letters. They've never heard of e-mental health. They can't wait to try it. And there's, there's too many websites out there for them to sift through all of them. So there's a, a huge appreciation for the work that you've done. I'm seeing a number of smiley faces as well. So technologically people, uh, technology people uh, are, are really uh, appreciative of this talking about the greatness of the resources and thanking both of you for participating. So we do have time for, for questions. I, I, the comments are tremendous, but do people have specific questions for Don uh, or for Michael or even questions about the uh, National Infant Child and Mental Health Consortium that we might be able to answer for you? 
And again, you can do that by speaking up on the phone. You'd have to unmute yourself. Are we? No, I would be able yeah, to. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to unmute everyone if someone wants to speak, but there's also the possibility of typing in your questions. So we'll try to moderate both. So do you find that there is an increase in numbers in young children with mental health issues? <laughs> That's about a three-hour discussion in itself. Um, to, to answer that question, you need to um, have, um, it, it, and I think there actually are some proposals um, looking for funding right now about doing things like repeating the Ontario Child Health Study, which is probably one of the epidemiologically most strongest um, studies we ever had about the prevalence of mental health problems. It was done in 1983 and in 1985. So to repeat this at a, at a 30 year anniversary um, would be an incredible way of understanding a really good answer to that question. We certainly understand that there's a greater awareness um, of mental health problems. You can you could take a look. There there are some people done some nice work around autism and, and has the prevalence actually gone up? Well, what we see is, is a, a number, of, um, say a decade ago, the children or, and young people who were diagnosed with developmental disorder not otherwise specified has gone down directly proportional to the number of kids who have been diagnosed with autism going up. So, so it may not be that there's more cases, but in fact, we're much better at picking out those cases and, and, and uh, attaching a useful um, label and, and diagnostic category to them. One other thing that we know from the early work in, in the 1980s uh, was that about one in six children and youth with a diagnosable mental illness, illness actually access services. Many reasons for that, but a, a main driver of that is actually stigma. And we know because of the, the public dialogue that's happening at a community level, at a provincial level, at a national level with the leadership of the Mental Health Commission of Canada, we are starting to see many more conversations about uh, mental health. We have people identifying themselves as having suffered or currently suffering from a mental illness. And through that ex increased exposure, uh, more and more people are identifying their needs. Now that's good news in terms of people being able to access services. It's bad news if, for example, we go from one in six to two in six or three in six who have a mental health problem who then go access services. Unfortunately, our systems of care have not yet caught up to the real need in terms of child and youth mental health. I know one of our previous webinars looked at access and wait times, and that's why this is one of the focus areas of work by the National Infant Child and Youth Mental Health Consortium. It's not just about knowing you have a problem and getting in a line getting the right line, get access to the right service that's going to have the right kind of impact on the problems that you are currently facing. So again, we're looking to others that might have questions. Either raise your hand uh, electronically on your, on your keyboard or uh, uh, you can type in a question as well. Right, I'll just let you know that on the screen right now we have the uh, CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network and uh, CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers, is a member of the uh, National Infant, Child and Youth Mental Health Consortium and as that member we, um, we help to support by, um, by um, running these webinars and using our Knowledge Exchange Network to, um, to uh, help share information uh, across our network. So if you went to the Knowledge Exchange Network, I will be sending everybody a link to the Knowledge Exchange Network. We have our, um, all of the presentations from the consortium and all of the uh, materials and references that uh, have been spoken about today. So we have uh, another question. It says, I'm having difficulties at my son's French Catholic school getting resources to help him at school where his issues seem to come out. Do you have any suggestions on who to contact? So, so I, I, I just wait in here. I'm, again, not sure where this uh, person is, is coming from. Uh, if the question is about the availability of, of uh, resources in French, I know many of the resources that Don was talking about, the paper and pencil resources, are available in French. I know we are looking uh, for uh, the possibility of translating of, uh, resources currently on, on e-mental health. 
And I also know, because uh, I just see now that, that the person asking the question, Jay, thank you for your question, is from Ontario. Uh, you can also contact the Ontario Center of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health. We have been doing work with school boards across the province, and there are clusters of francophone schools that have been sharing resources and how they actually do the work, school-based work in mental health. Uh, and we can potentially connect you with some of the leaders doing, doing work with the francophone community. We hope that answers your question. Uh, Michael, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Welland or surrounding areas are currently on uh, e-mental health, uh, or to what extent that's been populated. Uh, but do you have a lot of information? I think there isn't there information that identifies whether the services in a given community are available in different languages? Yes. For any listing, there is a field that asks if the services are provided in English or French or in other language. So our database will tell tell you what services, uh, you know, what language the service is in. And for certain things on eMental Health, like our mental health information sheet, uh, all of the child and youth ones are bilingual, uh, and uh, for Welland area, which is Niagara, I guess, we actually are in, in, uh, in the process of developing local partnerships with uh, uh, local content partners in that area. Uh, we have, at the Center of Excellence in Ontario, we have also done webinars, very similar webinars, for the leaders in, in school-based mental health, looking at some of the school boards and the, and the linkages between mental health service providers and schools. So increasingly, we're finding that teachers want to have access to tools like e-mental health. And we're showing them how it might be of value to them in their role as well. Well, at this time then, I think I, I'd like to thank all people for participating today. Uh, and But uh, very much like to thank uh, both Don and Michael for uh, the quality presentation they made for us today, but also for the ongoing work that they do for child and youth mental health. Uh, I think they've, they've really demonstrated how the only way that this stuff works is through partnership. And I know that uh, Michael and Don are, are uh, masters at uh, establishing and maintaining partnerships because none of us can do this by ourselves. I'd also like to thank uh, Lisa Stromquist for organizing this webinar on behalf of the National and Child Needs Mental Health Consortium. Uh, typically after a webinar, we do send out a, a uh, survey just to get a sense of whether you got anything out of this or not, whether it was worthwhile to you or not. We really encourage you to get back to us with comments about how we can improve these. Um, uh, this is a part of a series of webinars. Keep yourself posted for the next upcoming webinars. Uh, they tend to happen every three or four months. Uh, but all the topics are things that you have indicated to us that you want to hear more about. And we do actually have another question. It says, uh, we are calling from northern BC where our services are very limited and an example of this would be that we do not have a pediatrician in our community and yet we have the highest birth rate per capita for BC. In saying that our services for mental health are just as limited. Our clinicians that we have are both solid and have a wait list as long as, as you can have guessed. So the information you have shared will be very helpful for the services we provide to the families we work with. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for that comment, Susan. So any, any parting words, Michael or Don? I look forward to Just hearing to from people and, part, and, can, and hoping to find new partnerships uh, with new members uh, that we're not already partnered with uh, from people who are presenting today or here today and uh, look forward to continuing our ongoing partnerships. And, and just one follow-up point to, to Susan, um, the, one of the organizations I've done some work with is the Canadian Pediatric Society. We have a version of our, uh, some of our book lists on there as well, but they have a wealth of information that goes beyond child and youth and mental health into child development and a number of um, excellent guides for parents, written for parents. Um, so that, that may be something that you'll find useful as well to take a look at the um, Caring for Kids site, which is part of the Canadian Pediatric Society site, and they have a lot of high quality information. I, I'm very impressed with their um, whole processes for developing the information. And overall, I'd like to echo uh, Mike's uh, words. Thanks for inviting us, and um, thank you, Ian, for making it so easy to be a partner. Well, that's great. Thank you, Don. Another last comment here from Daniel. One out of five makes this super important. I think that talking about the prevalence of mental health problems in children and youth uh, means that we have to look at innovations in terms of how we
communicate around these issues, we inform the general public, uh, we facilitate access to care, but also in terms of providing care in more remote and innovative ways and using technology. I know that our last webinar uh, that included participation by Dr. Pat McGrath, he shared some of the work that they're doing in Nova Scotia, uh, which allows for distance support for families, and they've been showing some very good outcomes especially in those communities where you may not have access to a mental health professional. So if you haven't had a chance to, to view that particular webinar, I suggest you go to the archive and you'll be able to hear uh, the presentation that was made a few months ago. So with that, we're going to close. And again, thank you all for participating today.